Good evening. For those of you who have not yet met, my name is Melissa Giller. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. Thank you for joining us this evening. Before we get started, in honor of the men and women who defend our freedom around the world, may I ask that you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So this is Ken's third official visit to the Reagan Library. The first time was in 2002. We had just received Air Force One, tail number 27,000, and we were looking for experts to talk with us about its history. Ken was one of a handful of people who came out to the Reagan Library to share stories about President Reagan's time aboard the historic aircraft. We then had him out, unbelievably, four years ago exactly today, to discuss and sign copies of his book, Prisoners of the White House, which looked at how isolation is becoming one of the most important, sorry, serious dilemmas facing the American presidency. Today, he is here to discuss copies of his latest book, Ultimate Insiders, White House Photographers, and How They Shape History. As one of my jobs here for the foundation, I'm constantly scouring all the photos taken during President Reagan's administration. Yes, all 1.6 million of them, for use in brochures, social media, and other projects. And I can tell you from firsthand experience that all the photos, from behind the scenes photos, to public events, to private moments, they all tell a story. And the photographers that are able to capture these pictures are true storytellers. I've been reading Ken's book, and I highly recommend it. For those of you who haven't yet purchased a copy, I suggest getting one after the program and having it signed. You won't be disappointed, and we'll keep selling it right over there. So let's get to it. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to introduce Ken Walsh. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, everyone. I, uh, thanks for coming. I uh, always love to come to the presidential libraries. I'm a big fan of presidential libraries. I've done a lot of research at them over the years, and I'll continue to do that. So it's a wonderful resource for the country to have. And um, Melissa mentioned I was out here, I guess it was my first visit, to help design that exhibit of Air Force One, which is a brilliant move to get, to get that plane here. Just a wonderful thing to do. Um, I've covered the White House for 31 years now. I'm one of the longest serving White House correspondents. I cover the end of President Reagan's presidency and then every president since then, including President Trump now. Um, when you're a White House correspondent, you're always looking for ways to lift the veil, get behind the curtain, to see the presidents as they really are, and tell the stories of presidencies in different ways. And that's what I've tried to do in my books, and this is my eighth book. This one is particularly interesting to me because I learned a lot, and it, I realized over these many years covering the presidency that these White House photographers, not the news photographers, but the staff photographers, are really flies on the wall. And they see things that no one else gets to see. They see presidents in private, in moments of crisis, and in you know, personal time, making decisions. They see the public moments, and they, if they can establish the bond of trust, and there's really two things that a staff photographer needs, the trust of the president and the first lady, and to be a good photographer. Actually, often it's the first that's the most important, getting the trust. Because if you don't have the access, you can't really get the pictures. And so as I'll be talking here, uh, of uh, some of the photographers had the access, some didn't. So we have a lot of ground to cover, so we'll get right to it. Um, <clears throat> this is, of course, the cover of my book. I can't resist showing you that. but. Uh, this is the first picture taken of an incumbent president. This is James Polk, taken in 1849. I show you this is not a good picture by today's standards, but in those days, it was a very primitive type of photograph they took, called the daguerreotype. They exposed the frame to, to the camera, and the person had to sit still for some minutes, and they actually had clamps to hold the person's head in place. You can't see them here, but this is what's happening to President Polk. Perhaps that's why he doesn't look too happy in this picture. <laughs> but technology has advanced so much since then. I'll talk a little bit about that later. But just this is sort of our starting point. Now, President Lincoln, when he ran for president in 1860, he was thought of as a backwoodsman, a frontiersman from Illinois. 
the rail splitter. This is the kind of cartoon and image that he had when he first ran for president. But he didn't think that was enough. He did, thought he had to show some gravitas so people would think he could, was capable of being president. So he was giving a speech in New York City to a group called Cooper Union, where the intelligentsia met. When he was there, he went to this photo studio. By this time, 10 years after that Polk picture, um, the uh, photography had advanced quite a bit. So he went to the studio of a photographer named Matthew Brady, who later became famous as a Civil War photographer. And Matthew Brady knew that Lincoln wanted to have pictures taken for his campaign, because Lincoln understood that image was important, the first president to really understand this, an image through photography. So uh, he shows up at the studio, and Matthew Brady is shocked. This is not a good-looking man, first of all. <clears throat> Secondly, he shows up in wrinkled, dusty clothes, <clears throat> and usually, what they did, they distributed postcard, we think of today as a postcard size pictures of famous people at the time, including presidential candidates, which is what Lincoln wanted. <clears throat> and so instead of showing the headshot, which showed the flaws of Lincoln's features and so on, they pulled the camera back, <clears throat> and this is the image they got, which is very smart. So you can see the stature, literally, of Lincoln, much taller than men, men of, most men of his time. Um, you see, you don't see the imperfections in his complexion and his clothes. And you see what Brady has done. He puts his hand on a stack of books to indicate sort of erudition. And people would study these pictures. They wouldn't just glance at them. They'd look at them carefully. And this worked. Lincoln later said this picture helped him win the election because it gave him more of a sense of, of being a serious person and a, a statesman. <clears throat> and it really worked for him. He continued to be. Uh, a devotee of photography, even he, when he, after he was in office. This is the famous picture after he grew his beard. People became very familiar with this image of Lincoln, the strong, resolute leader. And this picture was widely distributed. He had about, <coughs> excuse me, 130 pictures taken of him at the time. As Melissa said, President Reagan had, what, 1.6 million. Uh, today, President Obama had about four to five million pictures taken during his eight years in office. So you can see how things have changed. But Lincoln <clears throat> was the first president who really understood the importance of photography. And he let the photographers see things that <clears throat> the people were shocked at, such as how much he had declined. This was two weeks before he was assassinated. And look at, he's just frail. He's almost spectral. But he allowed this picture to be taken and distributed around the country to showing the difficulties and the burden of office. <clears throat> We're going to have to fast forward because I can't cover all the presidents uh, here. So we'll move on to Lincoln, to uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt loved to be, have his picture taken. He, uh, there was no chief photographer at the time. There were no staff photographers, so he would hire outside photographers, sometimes news photographers, to take his picture. Uh, he liked this idea of the strenuous life where you'd excel at everything you did publicly and privately. <clears throat> so he liked to embellished that image with the photography. He at one time took the photographer out while he was jumping horses. <clears throat> he came back to the White House, and his wife said, what happened to you? He was all scratched up and cut. He had fallen off the horse several times, <laughs> jumping the, jumping the uh, barriers. But he did get this picture, and this was the one they distributed. Um, this is when he went to the Panama Canal, which was his, one of his big achievements as president. He's in a giant uh, steam shovel. First time a president had actually left the United States. And, uh, and he also called attention to his agenda through photography, which presidents have done. This is, Californians will recognize it's Yosemite. He's out there with John Muir, the famous naturalist. So what he's trying to do is to use his own personal photography uh, popularity and transfer it to his agenda, which he was successful in doing. <clears throat> I always get a kick out of repeating the description his daughter had of him the larger-than-life man who was her father, the daughter said, uh, my father always wants to be the baby at every christening, the bride at every wedding, and the corpse at every funeral. So, <laughs> and that's a pretty good summary of t Teddy Roosevelt. His distant cousin, Franklin Roosevelt, people remember this picture. This is the image he liked to portray of him as the jaunty, optimistic person who was going to get us through the Depression and World War II. Uh, this is early on, his, uh, well, not early on, but after World War II had begun, he's meeting with Stalin and Churchill. You can see the commanding presence that Roosevelt had. 
And he also allowed the photographs to be taken in his decline. And not to be too shocking, but look at how he looks here. This is not long before he died of uh, had terrible heart problems. Look at how he's declined in this picture. But he let, he let the photographers take the photographs. Again, no staff photographers. These are news photographers. But FDR allowed this to happen. Um, <clears throat> this was the private FDR. His legs were paralyzed from polio. He contracted polio at the age of about 39. And he never could recover the use of his legs. And when you saw him in public events making his way to a podium, there was always two burly men on each side of him. He would lock his elbows in place, often one of his sons and a Secret Service agent, and they'd literally be carrying him, make it look like he was walking. But he had braces on his legs from his hips to his ankles that were locked in place. So he was all sort of an orchestrated <coughs> image because <coughs> he didn't want people to know how barely disabled he was. Um, the photographers at the time, and I did a lot of research about this, went along with Roosevelt when his press secretary said, we don't want to show the vulnerability of the president. So the bad guys of the world will take advantage of it. So they never showed the disability. When a new photographer would come on the White House beat, the veteran sometimes would slap the camera down, knock it out of the hands of the new photographer, and say, we don't take pictures of President Roosevelt looking that way. But he was carried to uh, cars. He was uh, used his crutches sometimes. He was wheelchairs. You, you never, almost never saw that. Sometimes, there, and I have a couple of pictures in the book showing this. That my wife, who's a professional researcher, and I have found some of the pictures of him being carried and we have one of them in the book, but they were very rare. And basically, they were taken by bystanders, not news photographers. So this was basically a, a secret. I think people understood that Roosevelt was disabled. They didn't realize the extent of his disability. And a lot of the news photographers at the time later confessed that they were sort of ashamed of themselves because they went on with this conspiracy of silence. They went along with it, but they did. And this, again, this is the Roosevelt image that he loved to convey, the V for victory which is the way the country remembered Franklin Roosevelt. President Eisenhower, I'm not talking about Truman because Truman, I just don't have the time, I have a chapter about him in the book, but Truman didn't believe in celebrity presidents. He didn't, he wasn't wild about photography. He just wasn't wild about stage management. So uh, he did allow some interesting pictures to be taken of him, but not on the scale of these other presidents. President Eisenhower takes over, and President Eisenhower realized what the country wanted from him after the Depression and World War II was normalcy. He didn't want to be um, flamboyant. He wasn't a flamboyant guy. So this is the kind of picture, just the couple, uh, Ike and Mamie, um, even to the extent of when they went to his home in Gettysburg in Pennsylvania, not too far from Washington, uh, Mamie, <coughs> Mamie insisted that the, uh, they would not discuss policy there or politics. It was just family time. So the kind of activities he allowed to be reflected in the photography, sometimes they let portrait photographers in or family and they were released. But this is the kind of atmosphere Amy, uh, Mamie liked. They're playing Scrabble. Ike doesn't look too wild about this, does he? <laughs> <laughs> he looks like he's sort of bored. His mind is elsewhere. I'd like to see what he's got on his Scrabble board there. <laughs> but, but this is uh, <clears throat> the normalcy that Eisenhower wanted to convey, which he successfully did. <clears throat> President Kennedy, this is PT-109, the, the PT boat that he commanded in the Pacific in World War II. They had pictures of him there. Uh, of course, the, the uh, PT boat was rammed by a Japanese vessel, sunk, and then Kennedy rescued uh, some of his crewmen at great um, risk to himself. So he was actually a hero. His father, Joe Kennedy, was not only a fabulously wealthy man and an investor, he was also a Hollywood producer. He made movies. He understood the importance of celebrity and image. <clears throat> he tried to groom his oldest son, Joe Jr., actually for the presidency, but he was killed in World War II as a flyer in Europe. So Jack Kennedy, with the second son, then stepped up the ladder, and he was the one who was groomed. So they, they, the father went out of his way to create this elaborate image as Kennedy's career advanced of this charismatic hero from World War II who was really would believe in vigor and getting the country moving again, which was his slogan, to the extent that uh, even when he was married to Jackie Kennedy, <clears throat> this was the big social event of the season in Newport, Rhode Island, and the, the uh, 
photo magazines at the time, Life and Look, did extensive uh, photo coverage of this. This is after they were actually married, and this is at the uh, lunch where the guests were about to line up there. But they were very clever in uh, embellishing this image of the charismatic president, and that continued when he was elected. This is the Kennedy clan on election night in Hyannisport. They had a lot of pictures taken. There was a photographer named Jacques Lowe, who was a photographer who they, they uh, hired an outside photographer to take pictures of him. He took, was trying to take a portrait of the family, but this is actually a more interesting picture. They're not re quite ready for the picture to be taken, but you can see Jack is at the center of attention. Everybody is just deliriously happy, <clears throat> and uh, Jackie is looking over her shoulder at him, Rose, uh, Joe, <clears throat> Teddy, Bobby. It's a wonderful picture of the family, and this was very important in Kennedy's administration, and they tried to create that family notion in the White House. Um, they were taking a, Jacques Lowe was trying to take a portrait of the president and first lady and their daughter Caroline. Now, as we know, in families with little children, sometimes the children don't behave. <laughs> so during the, with the, the portrait ready, Caroline started nibbling on her mother's pearls. <clears throat> and Jacques Lowe, being a brilliant photographer, realized that's the picture. It sort of captures the essence of a, you know, a real family and a real, not, not a, a phony moment. This is really what happens. And uh, uh, Jackie looks a little sort of unsure what she's supposed to be doing here. And Jack is, is having a delightful time. And um, as the time went on, he, he realized how important the children were to his image. And so he would have lots of pictures taken of the kids. He hired a, uh, he brought in a military photographer named Cecil Stoughton, the first chief White House photographer. He was a captain in the Army, and he was in the sort of the, the photo corps. <clears throat> and he brought him in to take pictures of him to get the private side of the White House, the first time a president had done this. This included the kids. He would have the kids, and you see Caroline, by this time little John Jr. had to come on the scene, and he's clapping his hands, they're dancing for him. After a while, whenever the photographer took pictures of the kids, Kennedy would always say, you can't miss with these pictures of the kids, can you? And the photographer would always say, you're right. And this is, this is another picture, a wonderful picture, taken by Jacques Lowe of uh, Jack Kennedy and Caroline at, Ken at Hyannisport. <clears throat> this is the most famous picture, probably, of Kennedy. This is the wonderful picture of him at his office, at his resolute desk. They call the resolute desk, named from a British ship, uh, that was made from the timbers. Uh, little John Jr., who was about three years old at the time, called it his secret house because he discovered there was a little door there. So he'd get in the door, his dad would pretend to be working, and then sometimes he'd have people come in and little John would open the door and surprise them. So by this point, uh, Stanley Tredick, who was a news photographer uh, for, for the photo magazines, wanted to do a photo spread of the president and his son. So he kept asking Kennedy, when am I going to get the pictures? So Kennedy said, well, Jackie is now upset that too many pictures are being taken of the kids. And he said, I don't agree with her. I like the pictures being taken of the kids, because he knew it helped his image. But Jackie said, no, it's going too far. I, I, you know, they're getting too far out of normalcy. So Jackie went on vacation to Greece with her family, her immediate family. And Jack called Stanley Tredick, the photographer, and said, the coast is clear. <laughs> Come on over. So Stanley arrived just as little John was arriving at the Oval Office in his pajamas and bathrobe to have a little playtime with Dad. He goes to his little <clears throat> desk um, door, so he gets this picture. And uh, it's actually, it actually is a wonderful picture, and everybody who sees it always remarks on how terrific it is. Well, this is a little getting a sense of the, the public Kennedy, uh, the charismatic figure at the press conference. He really mastered them. Master Television, in addition to still photography, the image of this charismatic young guy who was going to move us to another level in our new ideas and so on. <clears throat> this he allowed private pictures to be taken of him with world leaders, which had not been done very much before. Uh, this is Nikita Khrushchev, the leader of the old Soviet Union. This meeting did not go well. He was meeting Khrushchev for the first time in Vienna, and you can sort of get a sense of the awkwardness of it. Kennedy's trying to impress Khrushchev, who doesn't look very impressed. This meeting was, went so badly, Khrushchev thought that Kennedy was immature and weak. So he, of course, he tested him later in the Cuban Missile Crisis, and he misjudged him, because Kennedy got the better of that confrontation. But from this meeting came an impression that Khrushchev had that Kennedy was an easy mark, which he was not. 
So he misunderstood it. You get a little sense of that from the picture. And uh, Kennedy also learned from photography himself. This is another important point. He was very well aware of the civil rights movement. When he took office, he thought he was going to be a foreign policy president. He didn't have much interest in a lot of domestic issues, didn't have a lot of interest in the civil rights movement. Uh, the only African American he had contact with was the valet who laid out his clothes and drew his bath every day, literally. That's the contact he had with African Americans. But he started to see pictures like this. The police dogs attacking the protesters, the, the fire hoses, the beatings. Being a hero from World War II, he respected physical courage. So he saw this kind of picture, and he came to respect the courage of the demonstrators greatly. And that was a big turning point for him. So it's sort of a two-way street. Presidents can learn a lot from photographs themselves, which Kennedy did. And by the end of his presidency, he had more African Americans in the White House than all the previous presidents combined uh, in one, one time when he had the civil rights people who were going to protest uh, at the uh, Lincoln Memorial. So <clears throat> and this gives a little sense of how those meetings went. Uh, he's sitting in the rocking chair because he did have a lot of physical problems himself. <clears throat> this is a, another famous picture of Kennedy. This was taken by George Thames of the New York Times. You can see what's happening here. He's bringing in different photographers. He's got his own photographer, Cecil Staunton, who has his own little staff of photographers at the White House. He's bringing in outside photographers that he trusts, who thinks he'd do a great job. Here, George Thames, who actually I knew before he passed away, um, he decided he wanted to do a day in the life of the present, which is a standard journalistic conceit, really, that you do a day in the life of the present. It's all orchestrated, but basically it's a nice theme. And he got amazing access. He could walk in the Oval Office uh, whenever he wanted during that day. Sometimes they threw him out because of security uh, discussions. But basically, he got amazing access. And he saw Kennedy standing at the window with his head down. And he entitled this picture, The Loneliest Job. Looks like Kennedy has the weight of the world on his shoulders. That's not at all what this is. All that's happening is Kennedy's reading the newspaper standing up. <laughs> that's all it is. But George went along with this, because everybody who saw it thought, wow, well, what the burdens of office and all. So he let that sit as the uh, image. And Kennedy liked it, so he never corrected it either. And when he saw the proofs, this is very unusual, because today photographers would not show the president proofs in advance of layouts in their publications. This was on the third page of the layout in the Sunday New York Times Magazine. And Kennedy tapped it and said, George, that should have been your cover, this picture. And he was right. So he actually knew better about the photography than the photographers did. <clears throat> and this is the final uh, moment uh, where Kennedy has been killed. This is his uh, funeral in Washington. A huge number of photographers, including his chief photographer, Cecil Stoughton, are taking the pictures. Uh, they're focused basically on Jackie and Bobby and Teddy and Caroline. Only two of the photographers got this picture. It only lasted very briefly, a couple of seconds. What happened was um, Jackie bent down and whispered in John Jr.'s ear, why don't you step forward and salute and say goodbye to Daddy? And that's what he did. And that's the, the salute that, that so many people remember, one of the most famous presidential photographs capturing that horrible experience for so many people. Uh, Lyndon Johnson this is probably the most famous White House photographer, a photograph. Lyndon Johnson is sworn in on Air Force One in Dallas. Kennedy has been killed. Um, Lyndon Johnson thought that he could use this photograph to show that the Constitution endured and that he would continue the Kennedy legacy. So he wanted not only to be sworn in on the tarmac <clears throat> on Air Force One, he wanted Jackie to be with him, and he wanted the photograph taken and sent around the world. So they brought Cecil Stoughton, who had been Kennedy's photographer, in to take the picture. He stood up on a couch and got it a little from above to get a better angle. <clears throat> it's not a great picture. But it did the job. It showed that in the Constitution uh, enduring and the Kennedy legacy. The Kennedy family was upset that Johnson had J Jackie in the picture. She's still wearing the outfit she wore that morning with her husband's blood on it. She refused to change her clothes. She said she wanted everybody to see what they had done to Jack, in her words. But uh, she understood what Johnson was trying to do. She never uh, had any problem with this picture. It's the staff that did. But basically, uh, Johnson understood the importance of this and had Cecil take the picture. Now, uh, Johnson immediately had problems with Cecil Stout because um, he would go over the pictures that Cecil took every day, and he'd sit at his desk. And always, people always ask me, 
how are they approved to release? Well, some pre presidents do it all themselves. Not anymore because there's too many of them. But in those days, he would sit at his desk, Johnson, and look at every print and contact sheet, and he'd throw them on the floor if he didn't like them. And sometimes he was, there was none left. And so he'd say, see, so why don't you make me look as good as Jack Kennedy? Well, <laughs> that was not going to happen. So he fired Cecil Stoughton, <clears throat> and uh, he brought in a, another photographer. But this is the kind of thing he thought he would show to people as sort of this rough-hewn Texan. Uh, he would lift his beagle dogs up by their ears. I don't know if those of you a certain age might remember this. But he did it the first time, and he did it more than once, as you can see. And he thought, this is great. It shows, you know, I, I'm sort of playing with my dogs and all. But he got so many letters people saying, you're abusing your beagles, that he didn't do it anymore. Uh, he also had strange ideas about public relations in other ways. He heard that people thought when he had a gallbladder surgery, he had cancer. And he didn't want that image to be out there of him having cancer. So he, he went out on the White House lawn, had the news photographers around. And sorry for the image. He lifted up his shirt to show his gallbladder scar. Now, I don't think any president would have done this but him. <clears throat> but it, it actually worked because then the, the country thought, well, okay, maybe he doesn't have ca uh, cancer. It is the gallbladder. But uh, Johnson um, was sort of a whole different idea of public relations than other presidents. Uh, this is the kind of image he liked from his ranch in Texas, the cowboy. He was a good writer. He liked to, to uh, put this kind of image out. <clears throat> this is a famous moment. Publicly, he was talking about the Vietnam War being won. It was not being won. Uh, and the country was starting to have serious doubts about it. He didn't know really how to withdraw from Vietnam with, with honor, as he described it. And he was going through these agonies privately. All these soldiers were being killed. They were not getting anywhere in peace settlement or, or winning the war. And his son-in-law, Chuck Robb, who was a Marine um, combat leader, <coughs> uh, captain at the time, sent his father-in-law, Chuck Robb later became governor of Virginia and senator from Virginia, sent his father-in-law a tape, which you could see at the bottom right of this picture, the old reel-to-reel -reel tapes describing what was really going on in Vietnam. And it was not a good picture. And as you can see, Johnson really troubled by what he's hearing from his son-in-law, who he had ordered, of course, as commander-in-chief into the combat zone. And so this was a revealing moment that uh, he allowed the photographers to capture. Uh, as I said, he uh, fired Cecil Stout, and he brought in a photographer named Yoichi Okamoto, who was a Japanese-American. A fascinating story, because Okamoto was one of the best photographers ever to cover the White House. He was a, he was a storyteller. He knew the importance of telling stories, such as this one. He had a deputy who actually took this picture, but Okamoto had the idea. And Okamoto uh, would stand up to Johnson. Johnson still had some, you know, he was very abusive to people many times. But, and I'll show you a picture of Okamoto a little later. You can see how difficult that must have been because he was very diminutive and Johnson was a towering figure. But he did stand up to Johnson and Johnson did respect that. But this is the kind of picture that Johnson put out there. But he never could really bond with the country after the war went badly. Nixon, uh, President Nixon takes over. He wanted to be the tough, uh, strong leader at all times. You don't see many pictures of the private Nixon, you know, uh, the uh, guy who might have been, you know, devoted to his children or his wife, his daughters or whatever, because he didn't think it was worth his time to put those pictures out or to either pose for the photographs. He had a chief photographer named Ollie Atkins. He had a philosophy of six and out. He listened to him snapping the pictures, and after the sixth time he heard the shutter, he said, Ollie, you're out of here. So you almost never saw those private pictures that can humanize a president and make a president look more um, uh, sort of the kinder, gentler president. Occasionally, he did try to uh, reach out to people. Um, one time, there was a call at the White House. Somebody, the voice on the phone said, this is Elvis Presley. I'd like to meet the president. Um, the staff said, oh, sure, this is really Elvis Presley. But it was. So they arranged a meeting with the president. Elvis was a fan of law enforcement, and he wanted to get a badge so he could help catch drug traffickers. The irony is he was abusing prescription drugs himself <laughs> at the time. So Nixon said, well, I don't know about this Elvis. I don't know. What am I going to talk to him about? But they said, the staff said, well, look, <clears throat> young people would like the outreach and all, so why don't you do it? So he did it. And this is the picture they came up with. So Elvis got his badge, and 
Nixon got his photograph. This is the single most requested photograph of any president in the National Archives, by the way. People still want this picture. And the best chit chat that they could come up with was Nixon said to Elvis, that's quite an outfit you have on there, Mr. Presley. <laughs> and Elvis said, you have your audience and I have mine. <laughs> so it was a pretty good, pretty good response. Um, <clears throat> the night before uh, Nixon left office, he had announced his resignation. He was re re leaving office the next day. You might remember that two-step approach. It was August of 1974. The rare case where he asked his chief photographer to combine the residents to take pictures of the family on their last night at the White House. And it was a very sad and moving uh, moment. And Nixon actually did leave his, let his guard down, as his family did. <clears throat> Pat is not in this picture, but you see Tricia with her husband Edward Cox burst, ready to burst into tears. He's hugging his daughter Julie. His whole presidency, the whole center of his life is coming to an end. Um, the photographer didn't know what to say or do. He was, it was such a sad moment. He just wanted to get out of there as soon as he could. But he did get some pictures, and they didn't put these out immediately, but they're in the archives, and so we have, we have found them. So it is part of the visual history that he finally relented <clears throat> and allowed the private Nixon to be seen, at least in the photographic record. And this is a picture we found, uh, I think it's sort of a poignant moment. This is his last meal. This is a man who had been to the height of power he had achieved his, his vision, he, the pomp and circumstances of the president. And his last meal is like, some, somehow this strikes me as all, awfully sad. He's got the pineapple ring, the cottage cheese, and the glass of milk. Nothing special. Uh, and this is, the, this is how he left the White House, this very Spartan regime, I guess, realizing that his, the glory days were over. Um, president Ford comes into office. He had Richard Nixon's vice president. He had a fabulous photographer named David Kennerly, who I think has done events here. David Kennerly uh, did get the trust of the Fords. He had taken the pains to get to know the Fords when President Ford had been vice president, so he got a, really a, an advantage that way. And so Betty Ford and <coughs> Gerald Ford trusted Kennerly uh, completely. And he had tremendous access, and he insisted before he took the job, he had been working as a news photographer, he said, I'm not going to do it unless I have full access. I don't want anybody controlling where I can go and what I can do. And the Fords agreed. Not even the chief of staff could keep him out. So he had great pictures. He, this is a picture of Ford with his pipe. Uh, he took, he took <laughs> the news photographers, and Kennelly got pictures of the embarrassing pictures. Ford was a guy who was very magnanimous. Uh, and he couldn't convey his best qualities to the country no matter how good the pictures were. I was at the Denver Post at the time. <clears throat> I covered Ford when he went to Vail to ski. And then I won his, the award named after him a couple of times. And he gave me the award. And he said, so you're the guy who did those stories about me when I was skiing and falling. And I said, well, yeah, I did, Mr. President. And he said, well, it's nobody's fault but my own. I'm the one who took the spill. So I only blame myself. And I thought that was, that was pretty impressive of him. He didn't blame the photographers either. <clears throat> this is the kind of pictures he'd allow taken. Can you think of another president who would allow the pictures taken of him in his jammies? <laughs> He's having a meeting. That's Don Rumsfeld there, uh, later, you know, Secretary of Defense. Uh, and, um, but Ford didn't mind. He said, this is the way I operate and let people see it. So this is what he did. And uh, Betty was also uh, a wonderful subject for photography. She had lots of great pictures taken. She said, uh, as he was about to leave office, of course, he loses the election to Jimmy Carter. She said, you know, she had been a dancer. She said, you know, I always wanted to dance on the desk in the cabinet room. <laughs> so she jumped on the desk, and she started to dance and do some pirouettes, and Kennerly took her picture. So this you can find at the Ford Library, where I just was last week to do a talk. But it's, it was, they were actually a wonderful couple, but again, couldn't really convey, despite the excellence of the pictures and the access, they really couldn't convey their best qualities to the country. Jimmy Carter is elected. Uh, the reason I don't have a lot of Jimmy Carter is that he does he never named a chief photographer. He always said, uh, it's, it's not worth my time to have a chief photographer. He didn't trust the photographers. He, he didn't want to name any. Uh, he just felt that he didn't want to have that kind of a trust relationship. And he would say, I, didn't, I don't want to Kennerly around here in all the meetings. I just want to just control it more so. You didn't see a lot of the private photos of Jimmy Carter, and I think it hurt him. I think presidents should do that. I'll come back to this in a bit, but who's doing that now is not interested in the private photos? Donald Trump, and I'll come back to that in a minute. 
Um, <clears throat> but now we have President Reagan. This is one of his favorite pictures of all time. Uh, his photographer, the man who he later hired as his chief photographer, Michael Evans, took this picture for, I guess it was an equestrian magazine before the president took office. And Reagan always loved this picture, and Nancy always loved this picture. The Westerner, the uh, genial guy, the sort of Washington outsider, the affable, it all came across in this picture, and he loved it. And the country loved this picture. When he passed away, this picture was revived and was on the cover of magazines all over the world and used on television and also. Uh, Michael Evans, uh, I, I, I looked at a lot of his diaries and descriptions. He says, I can't remember what I said to make him smile this way. <laughs> but he said, I captured it perfectly. And I got him to give that great Reagan smile. Um, <clears throat> this is the uh, assassination attempt. Uh, he was in office only for a few weeks. And uh, he left the Washington Hilton Hotel. We were giving a speech. He was getting into his limousine. And this is the moment when the first shots rang out. And you can see the Secret Service guys looking startled over at the shooter, John Hinckley Jr. What's happened is this is the moment that the bullet hits Reagan. Hits him in the, in his chest, in the uh, ribs, almost hits his heart. Uh, at this point, he's not sure if he's been hit. He's pushed into the car by the agents. And he thinks the agents have broken one of his ribs. That's why he thinks he's got the pain. There's a little brief debate where he should go to the White House. The agent says, no, you're going to the emergency room, Mr. President. Take him to the emergency room. That saved his life. Because <clears throat> if he hadn't gone to the emergency room, he was in such distress, he probably would have died. This is one of the Pulitzer Prize, by the way, this picture. <clears throat> it was taken by an AP photographer named Rod Edmonds. Uh, the White House photographer, Michael Evans, was out of position to get the picture but the news photographer did get it. The other interesting point here is that even the photographers sort of can use bad judgment, and even though they have the tremendous access. Evans goes to the hospital, <clears throat> sees Reagan get out of the car, hitch up his pants by himself, no one's wanted any help, buttons his jacket, walks in, and then collapses in the emergency room. Um, because he always wanted to look like he wanted to play the part of the, res the, pre of the pr strong president. I'm not saying that critically. That's the way he wanted to operate. Uh, Evans <clears throat> was so shocked by Reagan's condition that he didn't take any pictures of him in that emergency with Nancy with him and all. He said, I was just so shocked, I, I just froze. And uh, you know, that's not the best instinct for a photographer. But he was so devoted to Reagan that this is what happened. And this is the next moment where Reagan's even being pushed in the car. That's not the one that won the Pulitzer, the earlier one was, but this is the next frame, basically. And he only got five frames. But anyway, that, this is the next moment where they're pushing him in the car. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of fabulous pictures of Reagan. He allowed the photographers to capture him uh, at moments of high drama and policy. This is in the, after the Reykjavik summit with Mikhail Gorbachev, the summit failed. They didn't get the big agreement they were looking for. They were trying to actually come to an agreement to end nuclear weapons. Uh, Reagan refused to give up his strategic defense initiative designed to shoot down enemy missiles. Gorbachev wouldn't go along with it. They, they leave the meetings and look, they look so uh, disappointed, of course. <clears throat> They're re approaching Reagan's vehicle. A junior staff photographer on the White House staff was there, took the picture. It's Pete Souza who later came back as Obama's chief photographer. He was a junior photographer at the time. He gets the picture, and he hears through the interpreter their, their final words to each other. Gorbachev says, I don't know what else I could have done. And Reagan says, you could have said yes. <laughs> he reports it to the White House press office, and that is in all the stories the next day. So this is the, the classic story that I'm talking about here. The, the observations that these photographers can get sometimes are really historic. <clears throat> and he did get that in this case. This is the Brandenburg Gate, tear down this wall, another very famous moment for Reagan. I happened to be here at the foot of this, uh, this uh, podium. It was about 20 feet above the crowd, but there's a little group of reporters that are always with the president. We rotate that in the press car. I happened to luck out and be there this day, where he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, a very famous moment captured on film. And um, this is uh, an interesting moment. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but uh, Reagan had tremendous correspondence during his whole life. And it was not known in the White House how much he had this pen pal relationship with so many people that he kept up for the rest of his life. He went to an elementary school in Washington, and he met a precocious young uh, student named Rudy Hines, who's the fellow there on the left. 
Um, and he kept up a pen pal relationship with Rudy Hines for the rest of his life. And Rudy attended his funeral as a, as a grown man and always respected Reagan. And uh, Reagan always had this reputation of being uh, too close to corporate America and rich people. But he did reach out. I was covering Reagan. Oh, I knew nothing about this. None of us knew this in the press corps. But he didn't want to intrude on the privacy of the African-American family uh, who he was trying to get to know. So here he, they're at their house. He's at their apartment. He went there secretly with Nancy to have dinner that the, the single mom cooked for them. And then he had them back at the White House, secretly. We never knew anything about this, but we managed to, to find the, uh, the, the photographs. Um, I'm sorry? Uh, yeah, 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 it is, yeah, 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 good, good catch. Um, but anyway, Nancy is trying to sort of chat up with Rudy, but Ron is interested in his meal at this moment, so, but that's the way he was. <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, he has a way, he had a way of letting his guard down and show his sense of humor. You don't get that much with presence anymore, but he sort of ingratiated himself with the country this way too. And uh, now we go to President Bush, his uh, successor, President Bush, uh, was really not a guy who understood photography very well or image. I remember um, interviewing him a couple of weeks after he took office, and I said, so how are you going to do things differently than President Reagan? You, have, you know, you're a different person. And all. He said, well, you know, I'll never be the communicator Re President Reagan was. I I'll never look as good as President Reagan did. And he said, I've been six foot three ever since I've been 18 years old, and people think I'm a little guy, he said. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? And he, he just he was very uh, insecure about it. But he was a very decent man, and uh, you know, we won't go into his current problems with uh, uh, David Copperfield. You, I don't know if you heard that story, but he's being accused of groping women. Um, President Bush, the father, yes. And he's apologizing for it. There's like five women who said he's done this now. Uh, it's, it's easy to find to Google. But, but anyway, um, I think he's a very decent guy myself. And uh, I always liked him very much. <clears throat> David Valdez, who was his photographer, um, had been his vice president photographer, managed to get the trust of the family. And that gave him the access he needed at the White House. What happened was uh, we were at Kenny Bunkport, and he said, uh, Look Magazine wants to do a photo spread of you on vacation at your estate in Kenny Bunkport. So the family decided, well, we don't want an outside photographer, but David Valdez, you can do it because we know you. You're our photographer. So Barbara said, yeah, okay, you can come by. Uh, why don't you show up at 6 o'clock in the morning, and then you can see what goes on. So this is the picture he got. Uh, he shows up at 6 a.m. The door flings open to the president's res bedroom. And all the grandchildren start flooding in. They jump into the bed, and the Bushes did this all the time. This is really the family that Bush was so devoted to. Um, Barbara is much more camera savvy. Look at George. George just looks like <laughs> he's not quite ready for this picture to be taken. And Barbara would, after something like this, would say, why didn't you brush your hair, George? You know, what's the matter? But he, he refused to do it. He felt like he didn't want to be managed. But uh, Barbara said to David Valdez, the photographer, as long as you get good pictures of my grandchildren, you can do whatever else you want. And that was his entree, and he understood that. So he had the trust of the family. But this is the picture that sort of made him uh, as the White House photographer. But Bill Clinton is elected uh, is here with uh, uh, Hillary and Chelsea. Um, <clears throat> This is the private Bill Clinton. He, he's a, he had a chief photographer named Bob McNeely, who he let get a lot of uh, behind-the-scenes pictures that they didn't put out at the time, but now it's in the visual record. Uh, he had a flash and fade temper. What's happening here, he's berating George Stephanopoulos, now the ABC commentator, who was then the White House uh, communications director, and um, saying, you get out there and you tell those media people that I'm doing a great job. He was literally furious. And you can see David Gergen standing there, uh, who's now, you know, who's gone through his White House period. And, um, but then the temper would fade. But uh, Clinton allowed this kind of picture to be taken. Of course, the big story was the Monica Lewinsky story. Um, a whole year, Kenneth Starr, the special prosecutor, was investigating this. And uh, the, all of the, the photographers had pictures of Monica Lewinsky, but none of them with him. 
a photographer for Time Magazine named Dirk Hallstatt, who's a friend of mine, um, spent weeks looking through his archives to try to find, he said, I know I've seen them together somewhere. He hired a researcher, they looked through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pictures, and they found this one. Monica had shown up at a rope line after Clinton gave a speech, and she would wear a beret to catch his attention. And she, boy, did she catch his attention. And so he managed to find the pictures. This was just perseverance in looking through the files to find the picture, and that's what uh, she did. And then, of course, couldn't, couldn't camouflage the difficulty he was in, and so a lot of his public events was the president under siege, which uh, he couldn't camouflage, as I say. Um, this is the fam most famous moment with George Bush, uh, the uh, famous uh, bullhorn moment. The 9-11 has occurred. Uh, the World Trade Center has towers have gone down. The Pentagon has been hit. The fourth plane hijack has gone down in Pennsylvania countryside as the passengers tried to take over. <clears throat> Three days later, Bush goes to Ground Zero in New York to uh, uh, congratulate the firefighters and first responders on the job they were doing and show his appreciation. Again, I lucked out and I was in the pool of reporters here. I was just at the foot of this off to the left here. And I, every, every, all of us who were there knew this would be a huge moment. He jumps up on the uh, burned out uh, hulk of a fire truck <clears throat> and he starts to talk and he pulls up a fellow from the crowd, it turned out to be a retired firefighter who came in volunteering to help find victims. <clears throat> and uh, he starts to talk and the firefighters start to shout, we can't hear you, we can't hear you. So he grabs the bullhorn, a spontaneous moment, and he says, you can hear me now and the people who knock down these buildings are gonna hear from all of us very soon. And that's exactly what the country wanted to hear. So it's, he does capture this moment very well and this picture captures the moment. So this is one of the iconic pictures of George W. Bush's presidency. <clears throat> now I have to move a little bit quickly here to get through all the pictures, There's so many to choose from. President Obama comes into office as a celebrity from day one, the first African American president, a guy who understood the importance of image and so on. Um, and I show this to show how much the technology has changed. Remember that first picture of James Polk? Well, boy, have things changed now. We have had the democratization of photography. Everybody can take pictures with their cell phones, which happens all the time now. You can send pictures all over the world right a moment after you take them. They're all in your, in your phone. And, and everybody's taking pictures of everything now. And, uh, uh, and that happened with, with Obama. <clears throat> Pete Souza, who became Obama's chief photographer, as I said, had been Reagan, one of J Reagan's junior photographers, he takes full advantage of the advances in technology. Not only the digital photography, <clears throat> which actually Eric Draper, who had been George W. Bush's chief photographer, digitized the whole White House photo operation. Uh, Souza keeps that, but he also understands that this, the dissemination is uh, fabulously better than it used to be. So he uses the White House email account, the White House website, the uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and he sends these millions of, of people get these pictures uh, every week. And he starts to create um, a persona for himself. And he starts to describe how I got the picture, how, you know, what's happening behind the scenes and all. And he's still doing that now. You might see the book, he's got a picture book, uh, sort of a tribute to Obama. Um, I, I, mean, I talk about all the photographers. He's just talking about Obama. But basically, he, is, uh, he, he moved this to the level of sort of Pete Souza Enterprises at the White House, where uh, ph photography uh, became a fabulous tool for the public relations of the White House. <clears throat> Got some great images. Obama came to trust him very much. This is the famous Situation Room moment where the raid on bin Laden that Obama had ordered was going on in real time. You see the military officer there is controlling the uh, computer images. Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State, sees something that's troubling her. We're not quite sure what it was. She never said. <clears throat> but this was a fabulous moment in the sort of holy of holies at the White House, the Situation Room, that Obama allowed to happen. Uh, you got a great sense through this, through Pete Sousa and through other photographers, of the lack of privacy the presidents have. So behind the scenes, uh, difficulties the presidents have. This is President Obama and Michelle in a freight elevator. A lot of presidents travel in freight elevators because they're, they're secret, uh, they're, they're not generally known where they are. Um, they're having sort of a quiet moment. He's lent her his tuxedo jacket. Look at the Secret Service guys and the staff. 
They don't know where to look. <laughs> look at the floor, look off into the distance, look at papers. They don't want to intrude on their privacy. But this is the life of President Sleet. It's very hard to get the privacy once you're outside of the residence. And this is clear from the Obama experience, and he allowed that to be captured on film. This is one of my favorite pictures. Obama was very serious about being a role model for African-American young people. Uh, very serious about this, as, as was Michelle. Uh, and um, a st African American family came in when the father was leaving White House service to say goodbye to the president. So he has them in there, and the, the youngest of the man's sons looked at the president and says, your hair looks just like mine. I wonder if it feels like mine. So President Obama says, why don't you see for yourself? So he bends down, the little fellow puts his hand on the president's head, and Obama says, well, what do you think? And he says, yeah, it feels just like mine. And so it's, a, it's, it's an endearing moment. I think it was genuine, because Obama did do this a lot. And, uh, and uh, so whatever you think of his policies, um, I think there was a genuine desire on his part to be the role model in so many people. Now we're we'll up to President Trump. This is the image that President Trump likes to convey. Um, when I've given this talk, people say, why don't you show the friendly, smiling Donald Trump? Because he doesn't want to be seen that way. He doesn't let the pictures out. If he's having the pictures taken, he doesn't let them out. He wants to be the fighter, the guy who's sort of um, always battling, the, sort of the wrecking ball in Washington. That's, he describes it that way himself. This is the larger than life person he wants to be. Uh, this is him again, um, you know, the sort of the scowling, uh, almost angry Donald Trump. You're getting a little bit, now this is him again, the angry, lecturing Donald Trump. And again, uh, this is the image he wants to convey. I'm, I'm not, you know, depriving you of seeing this other stuff. Although there's some little indications that he's changing a little bit. This is him in a 18 wheel, or again, that angry, I'm going to take on the establishment guy. He's letting some pictures be taken of himself with his grandchildren now. Okay, I think that's good for his purposes because he's got to have, a, he apparently does have a good relationship with his grandchildren, but he hasn't trusted the photographers enough to let those pictures out. Um, one time a kid from Northern Virginia wrote and said, I want to be a businessman and I'd like to show my talents by mowing the White House lawn for you. So the staff, good staff work, said, okay, come on over. So the president went out to see the fella. It's sort of an awkward moment, but at least he's trying here to show sort of the more behind the scenes ingratiating Donald Trump. This is the first, this is, this is my <laughs> conclusion about he looks like he's finally getting the message that he has to have a little bit more of a kinder, gentler image. <laughs> Th this is the first official portrait of Donald Trump, at least in January. They just released the low one. <laughs> <laughs> Something has happened here. And I was at the uh, Frank and Roosevelt Library last week to give a talk, and uh, they just got this picture because they had been using the other one. It's just being distributed all over the country to, to federal offices. So this is the new Donald Trump, you know. A lot of people are sort of taken aback when they see it, but so something has changed, so maybe he's going to realize that these photographers can help him uh, if, he, if he lets them do the job. Now, just to wind up, before we take some questions, this is Cecil Stoughton, the photographer who worked for Kennedy and took that picture of Johnson being sworn in. Cecil uh, had, uh, was a very good photographer. He understood some methods of bonding with the family, such as teaching John Jr. how to run the cameras. So John Jr. always wanted to seek what he called Captain Stoughton, because Captain Stoughton would let him take pictures with his camera. So that was one entree, and it really worked for him. This is Yoichi Okamoto, who is Johnson's photographer, the Japanese-American. Uh, this is his, uh, him in action. This is him at the ranch. It's not a good picture, but it's, it's one of the rare pictures of seeing them together where uh, Yoichi, you can actually see what he looked like. Uh, you can see the difficulty it might have been for him to stand up to Johnson, you know, that very imposing figure. But he did do that, and Johnson respected that. So he understood Johnson. And he understood that uh, he, he, the best way to approach the presidential photographer's job is to be the storyteller. And in the end, Johnson respected that. Kennerly and Ford, you can see their, their uh, good relationship here. Um, and uh, that lasted throughout Ford's life. And this is Pete Souza uh, taking pictures of Obama uh, in action. Uh, this is the contemporary picture of some of the photographers. That's Eric Draper, who was George W. Bush's photographer, Bob McNeely, who was Clinton's, 
Dave Valdez, who was George the Herbert Walker Bushes, and that's Kennerly, uh, an older man now, but nevertheless, I thought you'd be interested in seeing what they look like. And this is Sheila Craighead, who's President Trump's chief photographer. Uh, there has been one other woman chief photographer. This is under Bill Clinton the last two years. A woman named Sharon Farmer became the chief photographer after McNeely left. Uh, McNeely was uh, upset that the president had lied to him about Lewinsky, so he couldn't felt he couldn't work there anymore. But Sharon stayed on. So, but anyway, Sheila is the second woman photographer. The problem is, I don't think trust, tr Trump trusts photographers, so she's. Just in, the, in those little moments that I've started to show you, there's something different going on now. He's starting to maybe see the value of photography more. But uh, if he's letting a lot of the pictures be taken, he's certainly not releasing them. So Sheila has a lot of work to do to, uh, to get in the, uh, the entree that she will need to get in that upper echelons of White House photographers. Uh, we'll see how she does. And then this is the final point is the news photographers. I have a, chapter, a couple of chapters about them. This is the life they lead. They're always herded around from one place to another uh, for little scraps of uh, moments with the president. Um, president Obama and Pete Souza ran into trouble with the news photographers because they didn't let them have the access that they felt that they should have. Pete was taking all the best pictures himself, releasing them as White House handouts. Obama, uh, Trump is doing that now. There was a huge fuss on his Asia trip at the White House. News photographers were excluded from many things. But you can imagine the frustration. You know, They're all paid to get these great pictures of the president. They're not given the opportunity to do it. So they're left in this kind of a situation, just in a scrum, trying to get you know, 10 seconds with the president to uh, get a picture. And it's almost impossible to do the job under those circumstances. And this is sort of the book. But, so what I wanted to do here with the book and, and with my talk here is just to give you a sense that this is sort of an un generally an unrecognized resource that America has in these photographers, this, the flies on the wall at the White House, if they can get the confidence and trust of the presidents, they have a wonderful visual history that they can compile of presidents that you can find at the presidential libraries. Uh, and uh, there are pictures, by the way. We can get them, uh, you can get them online, or you can come to the libraries and get them because they, won't, they belong to the taxpayers. And um, they just get reproductive costs, and that's about it. Um, the, uh, but the photographers, through their visual history, through their lenses, their observations, uh, they have uh, gotten this amazing access to presence. We can learn about them uh, from the photographers, which is what I tried to do in the book. So thank you very much for coming. We'll take some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was so wonderful. I could have listened as I'm feed by feeding back. Could have listened to those stories forever. We don't have a lot of time. Uh, maybe just a few questions. I saw a hand right over there, Melanie. Yes. Hold on one second. We're going to wait for the uh, microphone to get to you. Did John Kennedy ever wear his wedding ring? Because I noticed in both pictures of him, he never had a wedding ring on. I don't believe he did, no. No, I mean, you know, we, now the stories are out there. He was very devoted to his children. That was very genuine. Uh, was a womanizer in the phrase that is used, uh, and um, uh, there was a lot of uh, of troubling stories about how he was uh, he was uh, cheating on Jackie. But uh, wearing the wedding band was not a big deal with him. <laughs> he didn't he didn't wear it. No, not that I know of. There's a gentleman right over there. <laughs> Uh, recently, I've seen a picture with uh, Trump sh holding hands and shaking across there, and he's in the center of the photo. And Roosevelt was in the center of the photo with Churchill and Stalin. And I guess my question is, do they pose different poses for different countries? And would Stalin be in the middle of a picture what goes to Russia? Yeah, oh, yeah, well, yeah, sure. I mean, Stalin didn't feel any need to have any particular public relations in, in, in the old Soviet Union because he, he ran everything. But uh, you know, the democracy countries, yeah, they will. I mean, you know, the Prime Minister of Canada, well, Trudeau, will want to be in the middle of the picture for his people, for his constituencies. You know, yeah, that happens a lot. Um, when you see things like, I think you might be talking about the picture of Trump shaking hands sort of in that awkward way with all those Asian leaders, those uh, Asia Pacific summits have a history of bizarre moments like that. Uh, 
not the least of which is um, the outfits. They're supposed to, a lot of these summits are supposed to wear the, the, the native costumes that men will wear. And our presidents don't like this because it looks kind of bizarre to an American audience. Uh, and you see some of the things that Bill Clinton wore, you know, and I mean, I don't think Ronald Reagan would have worn any of that. But basically, this is a case where uh, something's gone wrong with the staffing with President Trump because a staff generally, you don't want to leave the president in an awkward situation where he doesn't know what he's supposed to be doing on camera, and he didn't know. Because, uh, you know, it was, it was an awkward thing where they, they, they were supposed to shake hands with each other like this instead of like this. And it would sort of be a line of sort of solidarity. And Trump didn't understand what was happening at first, and he caught on. But I just attribute it to bad staff work. They shouldn't be putting any president in that position. They need to go over every step of these public moments. That's why these trips are so tiring for presidents, too, because they can fall into these difficult image points, which, which Trump did in that case. I don't think people are making a big deal out of it, because he did catch himself after a while. But you've had cases where President Bush, the son, went to, uh, had a news conference, and he left, and he went to the door, and it was locked. And he was trying to go off stage, and he's fumbling with the door, and it's not opening, and he sort of goes like this, and finally somebody opens it for him. So uh, lots of times, strange things happen, but the staff can protect the president from that. And sometimes they don't. And that's what you saw in that one case. We have time for one last question. Why don't we make it right here? Mr. Walsh, do you or the other photographers, because you're creative, uh, are you able to go to the president when you're taking their picture and s say, sir, can you straighten your tie or can you fix your hair or adjust this, adjust this? Uh, why don't you turn this way instead of that yeah. way? The light's better this way. Than right. Well, I'm a, I'm a correspondent. I'm not a photographer. I've known all these photographers for, for 31 years now, and so I, I, I've dealt with them, and I've dealt with the news photographers too. And I know uh, exactly what you're talking about. Um, photographers who like the presence they're covering will do that. If they don't like them, they can make them look bad. Uh, and so if a president's tie is off or if he looks, looks awkward or weird, um, they, can, they can show that. And, um, and sometimes they do. If there's no uh, a bond there between them or the photographers feel like they're excluded or whatever, they, yeah, they can make the presidents look bad. There's many stories, and some of them in the book. Um, Harry Truman um, uh, liked the photographers, and they liked him. Um, and uh, in the beginning, he, they said, you know, you don't look so good with those thick glasses you have on. Why don't we give you uh, other glasses that don't have the thick lenses in them and it won't look as obvious? So he tried it and he hated it. And he said, no, I'm just going to wear the glasses. That's who I am. So they were trying to help him. You know, you look better with these other glasses. And that does happen. Uh, sometimes the photographers, uh, they, you know, human nature, they like the present. They will make them look better. And it's pretty easy to make them look bad, too. And it just depends on the relationship they have with them. I, that's, what, that's where Trump is, is heading for some problems here because he doesn't have a good relationship with the news photographers. And so, you know, unless that changes, he's got some problems there with his image. So that's the short answer. <laughs> so I want to thank Ken for coming today. Thank you. You know, he only just touched upon the stories that are in the book. So I really highly recommend you go ahead and buy that. Just really quickly, we do have Laura in.